Our speaker this morning radiates the love from his heart. He is affectionately known as the beloved. And I know he's going to bring an amazing message to you this morning. So I invite you to open your hearts, open your consciousness, and put your hands together and welcome our pastor, Reverend John Scott. Thank you, Sandy, and good morning, good morning, good morning, worldwide spiritual family. Happy Love Month, happy Black History Month, happy Reggae Month, happy birthday month of the Honorable Robert Nestor Marley. I have an assignment for our musicians. It just occurred to me as, we, as I was sitting uh, listening to Sandy. Our mission song for my the third Sunday of, of February, I'll be speaking again. Could our musicians, Angelo and Stevie Golding and everybody else, uh, Sandy, everybody else musical, put a reggae beat to a mission song for us? Is that possible? Yes. yes. You know, um, when Temple member Denise Inglis first came up with this idea of having a mission song, and it was hers, and she's here this morning. Thank you, Denise. She had said, you know, we could get musicians from every genre to create, we'd have the words, and then they would put their own particular rhythm and the genre of their music uh, to the words. So there you go. It's an idea whose time has come. Over to you, musicians, to give us a reggae beat for the third Sunday in February. Wow. Friends? I obtained a master's degree in the Applied Behavioral Sciences from Johns Hopkins University back in 1981. And I became a minister in 2003. I, I remember when I got that call, I said, I know me call you, and you call me, so check what you get. But friends, in all my years of counseling and experience with, the, with human behavior, I still am yet to understand the way men and women have totally different perspectives on life, on relationships, and in particular on love. Uh, a friend sent me this joke about this devoted wife who dutifully had been sitting by her husband's bedside as he slipped in and out of a coma for months, always there. And when he finally came to, he motioned to her to come near. He said, Gladys, come here, I want to talk to you. So she went dutifully, took his hand, tenderly sat on the edge of his bed. And he said, you know, you've been with me through all the bad times, them. When we went bankrupt and we lost the business, you was there. And when we did get shot, you did dead by my side. And when the car crashed and we broke up, you was there. And when my health started to fail, you was there. All the time you was there, right by my side. And so I talked, so she had stroke him hand. And said, Gladys, I want a divorce. <laughs> She said, but you're not easy, Herbert. What you say? Divorce you want? After I've been by your side all the time? He said, yes, Gladys. I divorced me, I say. You was always there. You know, so I said, you are the bad luck. You are the crosses. <laughs> Every time something bad happened, you did it. <laughs> what a tragedy it is, my friends when we refuse to take responsibility for our own actions, eh? It's always somebody else's fault, isn't it? If the streets are dirty, why doesn't the government do something about it? We never think, why don't I stop throwing debris through the car window? Or when I'm walking, eat and drop the fatty bag right on the side of the road. And if our children are unruly and don't have any manners, why don't the teachers do something about it? Hello, or who for you are them living? Who is supposed to set the example? 
But no, it's never our fault. Somebody else must fix it. And <laughs> sometimes when anything goes wrong, a uno, a no me. Sounds familiar? Time for us to start accepting responsibility. Too many of us, like the husband in my story, and it's only a joke, but, and the poking fun at our Jamaican men, but the scenario may be re replicated no matter what nationality you are or no matter where in the world you are. Let us start to take responsibility and to look at ourselves and what we are contributing in the game of life and how we play it as we sail through the sometimes stormy seas of our existence. So, you know, someone, a lot of, a lot of us, indeed, our, of our, our womankind, but both genders, give everything we have to the people that are significant in our lives. And somebody who I had, had in counseling many moons ago recently wrote me and said, you know, you talked one Sunday morning about the way you used to give your mother all the delicacies that she loved, which is true, I've spoken about it here. She loved seedless grapes, I bought seedless grapes by the kilo. She loved salmon, I bought salmon so that she could have it whenever she wanted. So I would make certain that her suppers were just absolutely gourmet and then I would rummage around in the fridge for some leftovers and I never forget sharing with our founding minister Dr. Elmer Lumsden uh, one day during one of our chats I didn't realize she was grooming me but that's what she was actually doing I said you know I took this two peas from last week and put some water in it and made red peas soup and she said just a minute just a minute dear you do that all the time? And I said, yes, I, 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 I don't want the leftovers to go to waste. And she said, so you give your, 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 your mother and everybody else the very best that you have, and you settle for leftovers, and it hit me for six. I always settled for what in Jamaica we call the walef. You remember, you know that, that term? Walef. So my friends, if you resonate with this picture I have painted, of shortchanging yourself in your relationships while lavishing the best on the significant others in your life, you need to remind yourself right here and now that as a beloved child of God, you deserve the all good too. And further, uh, this may be a hard pill for you to swallow, but I want you to know that if you don't treat yourself well, neither will other people because people take their, their cue from the, the thought atmosphere that surrounds you. And if you don't have a high enough opinion and enough love for yourself to give yourself the very best, the rest of the world is not going to honor that alone. Friends, the beautiful Jesus used to go apart to gather his energy and it is, it is, the Bible speaks of going up into a mountain. When, when it says that, and he, he took leave of the multitudes and went up into the mountains to be, to be there alone, I'll, I'll quote it for you, it's Matthew 14, 23. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening came, he was there alone. End of that scripture. So friends, when the Bible speaks about going up into a mountain, it is symbolic of ascending to the high point in consciousness that comes when we go within to commune with the creator of our lives and the sustainer of our existence through prayer and meditation. You see, we need quality time for ourselves just as we, we give of our quality time to the people around us and the people for whom we feel responsible. 19th century American philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson said, and I quote, guard well your spare moments. They are like uncut diamonds. Discard them and their value will never be known. 
improve them, and they will become the brightest gems in a useful life, unquote. God, well your spare moment. Save some of them for yourself. Don't discard them so that they become forgotten. Use some of that precious time for yourself. Even on the, in the airline industry, you know, they tell you if the, if the pressurization goes and the oxygen masks drop down, put on yours first before trying to help anybody else. Because you have to be in a state of wholeness and completeness before you can express that to the people around you whom you love. So this brings me to your assignment. And your assignment is in two parts this week. Regulars at the Temple of Light, Center for Spiritual Living, know that I always give an assignment when I speak. And I, I just know that there are some people who do it faithfully, and I bless them, and some do it occasionally, and I bless them. And those that don't do it, I also bless them, because we are gifted with the power of choice. But I hope you will choose to do this assignment this week. And the first part of the assignment is for you to schedule some gourmet time for yourself. Time in which you pamper yourself and work on building a conscious partnership with the divine. Remember the acronym I gave you a few weeks ago for change? C-H-A-N-G-E. Consciously having a new God experience. So take some time to have consciously have a new God experience this week. In her book, No Less Than Greatness, author Mary Manin Morrissey recommends that we spend a day with God. I love that concept. Give yourself a day with God. She writes on that quote, spend one day with God. This is absolutely private business between you and your creator. Nobody else knows that God walks with you as a companion throughout this day, but it makes all the difference in the world. As God moves from the background to the foreground of your life, everyday experiences become holy experiences, unquote. Morrissey goes on to recommend that when we shower, even bathing can be a sacrament like baptism. I love that. that when that water is pouring over your shoulders and you, you're feeling just the, the joy of being, of being bathed or bathing yourself, not just becoming physically clean, but allowing your thoughts to become clean with God. And so I have a, a, an affirmation that I say very often, and I've shared it with you before. It, it's that I bathe myself in appreciation and in the enlightened interpretation of my life's experiences. I break it down, you say it with me. I bathe myself in appreciation. Together? I bathe myself in appreciation and in the enlightened expression of my life's experiences. Uh, friend, you can do it whenever you're handling water. Water in the garden, washing dishes, bathing the dog. Just say, I bathe myself in appreciation. Start to love yourself. Make yourself your number one valentine. And as part of your spiritual practice, even when you're washing your feet. When I was a child and I went to primary school, you know, we used to take off our shoes and run around bare, in our bare feet. And then we'd go under the standpipe. I don't know how many of you have this memory of yesteryear. And you would wash your feet before putting on your, your, your shoes to go home. And when you wash your feet, your feet represent your understanding. Your feet represent your ability to move forward in life. So love your feet. Uh, you ladies, I think, are much better at, us, at, th at this than we men. You know, you go and have a, a mani-pedi. Uh, hand shell, foot shell, and face shell, as we say in Jamaica. But we men sometimes really neglect our feet, except we have a partner who looks after them for us. We need to look after what takes us forward in life. And so as you, as you look after your feet, remind yourself that where you stand in life is holy ground. Wherever your feet touch the ground. Reverend Elmo gave us a lovely, lovely um, mental picture one time we were on retreat with her. And it was that when we walked the labyrinth, with every step we took, 
a lotus blossom open somewhere on the, the face of the earth. Isn't that lovely? Wherever you step, something blooms, something comes to life, something becomes more beautiful because you walk the earth. So there's that lovely song, how beautiful are the feet of those that preach the gospel of peace. My friends, in your lives, you, by the way, you are living them. You, by the way, you love yourself are preaching the gospel of oneness, the gospel of love, the gospel of togetherness. How beautiful are your feet when you, just think of it, you sent by God to walk the earth as an ambassador of love and peace and understanding and beauty. So that's the first part of your assignment. The second part, uh, if you have a partner, then you can use them for the exercise. If you don't have a partner, just pick a relationship that you would like to improve. It could be with a parent, a child, a spouse, a co-worker, or a friend. And begin holding the thought each day, this person's true identity is God, and I am in partnership with God. This person, whomever you're thinking of, your partner, your loved one, um, your friend, your, your family member, your co-worker, whomever it is, this person's true identity is God. And then add, and I am in partnership with God. It means that you are in partnership with every brother and sister that crosses your path. Just think about that. And so... Make a conscious effort to relate to people with the same reverence and love you feel for that God presence within you. So number one part of the assignment, give yourself a day with God. Don't tell anybody, just say, today is my day with God. Whatever I do, I'm going to be conscious that I'm doing it with God and the presence is closer than my neck vein, it's nearer than my hands and feet, it's, 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 it's in my breathing, it's in my thinking, it's in my being, part one. And part two, Relate to others with the same reverence and love and joy that you lavish on that presence and power that's within you. In Morris's Day with God exercise, she advises that at mealtime, we imagine that we are dining with God at the table. When I first read this, I stopped eating out of, of plastic, um, you know, takeaway containers with the little fork or the little spoon or whatever they, they give you and started putting it in a proper soup bowl or a proper plate and knife and fork. Why, if I had anybody to, to, uh, to a meal at my house, no matter how casual the relationship was, I wouldn't give them in a cardboard um, box. I would, I would serve it on, on, on something that was worthy of my, my caring and my, my regard and my esteem of them. So why would I serve myself with God at my table as the honored guest in my home, something less than. And I have the good things, you know. Some of them I have to let them all crack up. Them dry rot. Let us start to use the good things we have when we dine with God. And when you are consciously relating to, to whomever is at your dining table along with God, because God is always there, it becomes very easy to recognize that presence and power within them. And you know what? You're less likely to have one eye on the television, to take or receive or to make telephone calls. You can give your attention to savoring the food and enjoying the company of whomever you are eating with. I think it's so important that we begin to live from the consciousness that we are the co-creators with the Almighty of this wonderful, wonderful existence, this wonderful beingness that we call life, and stop shortchanging ourselves. So I actually titled my encouragement this morning, Life is a Gourmet Meal, Don't Settle for Walef. You don't have to settle for the leftovers, my friend, because the table of life is spread before you, and you have been bid to come and help yourself to all the good that you deserve as a daughter or a son of the royal household of God.
And the added bonus is that you won't rush your meals, you will enjoy. And if you dine by yourself, you will enjoy the honored guest that sits at your table with you whenever you sit down to eat. God, the living spirit almighty, the one indestructible, absolute, and self-existent cause of your very beingness. Finally, Morrison suggests, suggests that when you are driving, be consciously aware of God in the car with you, God in the car as you, for God is your co-pilot. In fact, God is the pilot. You are the co-pilot, although it's your hand on the wheel. And remind yourself that every other motorist, oh God, John, yes, you must think about this with the taxes. Please remind myself. It is God on the road. And you know, strange as it may seem, commuting is often a time when people are distanced from the higher mind and from their higher self. You know why? Because anger and frustration so easily surfaces in traffic. There was a taxi man behind me, you know, and he, he couldn't wait for the, the light to change, you know, because he can see that it's going, to be, it's going to be green in the mid. So he starts honking on his horn. And when we got to the next traffic light, you know, I said, oh, my brother, I put my window down. I said, I'm just coming from Dovecot, and nobody's in a hurry out there. <laughs> Everybody is waiting in line to go down into a hole. So, don't hurry. You owe it to yourself and to your passengers to take time. He said, true daddy, a true daddy, and with that he tore out from behind. <laughs> from beside me. <laughs> Friends, this teaching, you know, known as the science of mind and spirit, equips you with the tools you need to live a happy, healthy, and fulfilling life. You need not settle for the Waleth, because all that you desire has already been provided by the one presence and the one power. And when you, you honor this presence and power and live from the consciousness that you are a co-creator with this presence and power of all that your heart desires, life becomes a glorious expression and a gourmet meal and you never have to settle for the leftovers. So ask yourself the question, am I treating myself with the same love and consideration I give to others? Am I allocating the leftovers to myself, to my precious self, to my God self, while I lavish all of my, the best of me, my time, my treasure, my every fiber of my being on other people, which is wonderful and they deserve it, but please look after yourself as well. Throw out the leftover salad, whether it be the soggy lettuce or the wilted ideas that no longer serve you. Throw the remnants of soup, the soup of misunderstanding and the soup that's full of all little bits of unresolved conflicts and disappointments and hurts. Throw it into the garbage disposal the garbage gobbler, and begin to live from the consciousness that you are worthy of the very best that life has to offer. And affirm frequently, I deserve the best because I am the best. I am in conscious partnership with God. Can we say that together? I deserve the best because I am the best. Together. I deserve the best because I am the best. I am in conscious partnership with God. A friend sent me a, a video of a young man uh, on the, uh, at the yacht club in, uh, in some Caribbean island. It, it, it's, it, I assume it's Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobago because the young man had this heavy, which I love, musical Trinidadian accent. And this young man, as he looked along the dock at all the, at all the ships moored, he said, it occurred to him that the most valuable things in life and the most valuable things we can possess in life are all ships. Friendships, partnerships, relationships, companionships. And he asks of his audience, what ship are you sailing in and with whom? 
Because, you know, sometimes on that journey, hardships will arise. And who you sail with and what your mental set is and where your heart is and your mind, that is the relationship that is going to of picture in your experience on that voyage. And he said, when those hardships arise, my friends, there is an important ship that will anchor us in God. And that ship is worship. Who oh, worship the King, all glorious. So that worship is what we come together on a Sunday morning either in person or online, to pool our consciousness in this safe harbor known as the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living, knowing that we are moored, we are anchored to something so powerful, so awesome, so beautiful, so joyful, and so wholesome and, and wonderful that we can only stand in amazement at the majesty, beauty, and might of that presence and power declaring itself as each one of us this Sunday morning. So thank you for being part of this experience, this spiritual movement. It is more than just a service. It is a celebration of the movement throughout the world because I am convinced that as we do this and as we worship in holy communion, in holy common union with each other, we are launching the energy of love, which is celebrated in February, but which we carry on the altar of our hearts, burning as a bright light through every dark period of life and into the glorious daylight and the awakening to our spiritual magnificence that we, who hunger and thirst after righteousness, and we who have taken the choice to celebrate God, to live from the consciousness that life is a gourmet meal, and that we never, ever again have to settle for our life. Namaste. Oh, thank you so much, Reverend John. We knew it was going to be an amazing message. And, and he really, really urged us to remember that we deserve the best. We are all sons and daughters of the one. And we need to honor ourselves as much as we honor others. We have some assignments. We have to find some time to devote to being with God. We have to... I like the one about the bath and to shower in appreciation and pick a, pick a relationship and just acknowledge that that person is God expressing. This person's true identity is God and I am in partnership with God. Isn't that something else? And to use up our good things and not wait until they dry rot and crack up. And to remember that life is a gourmet meal. This is the topic of his talk. Not to settle for the walef. Okay? And to think about that God is in our vehicles with us as we are driving. I deserve the best because I am the best. Let's say that together. I deserve the best because I am the best. Awesome. Okay, and now.